Look, war obviously is a tragedy, suffering a particular tragedy, the death of children. What? Just appalling tragedy. And we see the death of children in the latest conflict between Israel and Hamas, where the Palestinian propaganda machine and its robotic followers in the West constantly present us with, with horrible pictures of babies and children allegedly killed by Israeli missiles. Now, some of these images, frankly, are just fraudulent. We, we now know, for example, that during the Lebanon war in 2006, the same teddy bear, for example, was placed on top of rubble after Israeli attacks again and again to imply somehow that children had died and were buried underneath. Now, that particular teddy bear was pristine and spotless while there was garbage and filth all around. It seemed to not bother Western reporters at all, who, who suspend all incredulity whenever there is a chance to condemn Israel. And it was obviously a fake. We also know that faked photographs of missile attacks on Lebanon, Lebanon in that same conflict were also circulated and eagerly accepted by the Western press. They were exposed, as was the blood libel of the Janine massacre. Do you remember that? Which turned out to be nothing more than a, a highly responsible military assault by Israel on heavily armed Palestinian murder terrorist gangs. Now we have, well, I'm sorry, now we have dead children. I mean, it's horrible. And many of these cases are genuine, yes, but, but ask why. Look, thousands, thousands of rockets and missiles and bombs have been thrown at Israel by Hamas in the past few years, maybe four to 5,000. But Israel builds shelters, and the people of southern Israel spend a great deal of time sitting in them, much to the delight of the Palestinians. The government of Gaza, on the other hand, seems less inclined to safeguard their young. Instead of building shelters, they build missile launching pads, and they then place them beside mosques, schools, and hospitals. Please do not believe for a moment, please do not believe, that there is no other place to put them. It's a lie. It is a filthy lie. They are placed there strategically so that when Israel responds, there will be innocent casualties and Hamas can tell the world that the Jews are murderers. Gaza may be crowded compared to Canada, but I tell you, you can walk for hours in Gaza and not see or find another human being. Gaza city is full of people. Yeah, like any city, but, but Gaza is more than just one city. Again, think for yourselves rather than believe the nonsense. There are dozens, dozens of millionaires in Gaza, hundreds of thousands of modern cell phones, but than the one I have, the latest laptops, full grocery stores, and no Jews. They were removed long ago. Hamas uses its children as shields, as human sacrifices to the god of war and anti-Semitism, as blood offerings to some satanic hatred creature, and then convinces an eager liberal media that it's all the fault of the Israelis. They devalue innocent life, even the innocent lives of their own kind, and regularly, specifically target Israeli children when they suicide bomb discos, schools, family restaurants. Look, if you think I'm lying, okay, if you think I'm lying and trying to deceive you, read the facts for yourself. One last thing. I was in uh, Edmonton over the weekend in an Edmonton hotel on Saturday, and the CBC was on. I wouldn't watch it otherwise. There on the screen was this odd, ambivalent creature interviewing Gideon Levy, probably the most notoriously left-wing and anti-Israel journalist in the entire Jewish state. He was brought on to explain Israel to the, the, the Canadian people, okay? So you have this guy brought on to explain Israel to the Canadian people. Imagine, imagine if the most anti-Canadian writer in this country was hired by Israeli state TV to explain Canada to Israelis. We'd be bloody upset. Remember when I mentioned Naivety mingled with malice and anti-Zionism in liberal media. Hi, CBC. Disdain and deviousness are thy name. We are defending ourselves. We're trying to bring to an end the ongoing incessant barrage of, uh, of uh, indiscriminate attacks against our civilians that has been going on for years. Uh, it's not in any way a sense of retribution. It's uh, the attempt to uh, degrade the capabilities of those who are hostile to our very existence from perpetrating attacks that take away our ability to live a normal life. If they stop attacking, we will be able to stop defending. That was in response to a, a brilliant, objective CBC journalist asking, was this an eye for an eye? Which shows a colossal misunderstanding of what eye for eye actually means in scripture, but that's beside the point. Would they have asked such a question to a Palestinian representative? 
It's ongoing. There could be uh, some sort of truce by tonight, but we'll find out. He's been on the show when he was in Toronto. He's a columnist of the Jerusalem Post, wonderful writer. Jonathan Spar joins us now by Skype from Jerusalem. Welcome to you, Jonathan. Thanks very much, Michael. There were sirens earlier today in Jerusalem, were there not? Yeah, there were. This was the second time in the last uh, days uh, that there's been sirens and indeed been missiles directed uh, at Jerusalem not hitting Jerusalem, but on both occasions uh, landing just south of the city in the Gush Etzion area, from what we're hearing. Right. What is the mood now? Do, do Israelis assume, I mean, we're, we're hearing about a peace, some sort of peace by later mm -hmm. this evening, nine o'clock. Is that just a rumor or does that sound authentic? Well, it's a rumor, but it is acquiring uh, more and more substance to it as the hours go by. Of course, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton uh, has been here or is here. Uh, we're hearing that German Foreign Minister Guido Westerwell has now gone down to Cairo. Um, the Egyptians have been playing the central role in this uh, mediation from what we're getting, we're hearing uh, and understanding. So there's already now uh, rumors that it will come into force this evening and the hour being spoken about is, is nine o'clock or that it will be announced at nine o'clock and come into effect at 12 o'clock. So there is a sense that this does appear to be moving to some kind of conclusion. But at the same time, the negotiations are clearly still going on. Everything's still very delicate. There's still 50,000 Israeli uh, troops north of Gaza are ready to go in if necessary. So nothing is certain yet. Mm -hmm. And even if there is a truce, I mean, the question is, what will this solve in the long run? Uh, Israel ha has damaged, injured, certainly, Hamas's capability, but it can yeah. be rearmed. You, you, it, Egypt has to be... I mean, Egypt is a winner in this, it seems to me, because they seem to have been a peace broker. Uh, it's very hard mm -hmm. now for Obama not to give them money, and, and they're, relatively speaking, good guys. But they, they have to police from their side, do they not? Yeah, absolutely. I think the role of Egypt, uh, and when we begin to hear, if we hear it this, this evening, the, the results of the, the nature of the, uh, the ceasefire, the Egyptian role will be the thing to watch for. I mean, it's vital to understand, you know, that Egypt is, is in the middle of a contradiction here, because the Egyptian government is a Muslim Brotherhood government itself. That's to say it is ideologically more or less identical with the Hamas rulers of Gaza. But at the same time, the Egyptian the government has to rule over 85 million Egyptians with a real possibility if they don't get money uh, from the EU, from the United States, and from the IMF, some of those people could start to go hungry. So they just can't afford to play ideology now. Mm -hmm. So this, in a sense, has been a real test case more than anything else for this new Egyptian government. Is it going to choose its ideology, or is it going to choose, for the moment at least, the pragmatic interest of to get that money coming in from the West? And right now, at least, from that point of view, at least, there does seem to be some guarded reasons for optimism. Right. Of course, another winner, again, you're the expert, not me, but I would say another winner here is Hamas, because they were being challenged by Islamic Jihad. They've seemed to be tough. They've said, well, fight on to the last Palestinian child. And, and, and they are the, quite easily the, the, the leaders now of the Palestinian movement, the Palestinian narrative. I mean, the West Bank mm -hmm. is increasingly irrelevant in all this. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that's been coming for quite some time. By the way, I don't think Islamic Jihad were ever really a political threat to Hamas, although they did, of course, have their own independent and do have their own independent military or terror yeah. capability down there in Gaza and elsewhere. But yeah, I think we are seeing that, that Hamas is moving more and more to the forefront. And I would uh, stress this is part of a more general regional process. That's to say we're, we're seeing movements similar to Hamas triumphing in country after country, in Egypt, of course, most importantly, in Tunisia, in Syria, leading the uprising against uh, Bashar al-Assad. People or regimes that look a lot like the West Bank Palestinian Authority are departing the stage all over the Middle East. And movements that look a lot like Hamas are the ones who are taking their place. So to some degree, we shouldn't be entirely surprised that that's also coming home to roost right here next to the Mediterranean. You could even argue that Hamas's expulsion of Fatah from Gaza in 2007 was the real beginning of the Arab Spring or Islamic Spring, rather than what took place in Tunisia in 2011, the first time when an Islamist movement kicked out a nationalist authority. That's a very good point, actually. Uh, surely you would expect even after all this stops, you'd expect at least some more missiles to come in from Gaza into southern Israel, would you not? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the thing is, what we've noticed is that since Operation Cast Lead in 2008, early 2009, there was a, a sharp drop in the number of missiles after the operation and then gradually building up over the subsequent years until this year it reached a, an, an unbearable level, at which point Israel had to act. And I'm afraid the fact is, of course, there's not going to be any kind of political relations or normality between Israel and this uh, Islamist-controlled Gaza Strip. So the only kind of relations there can be are those of deterrence. That's to say, for as long as Hamas remains in control in Gaza City, I'm afraid it's very likely that every few years, in the best-case scenario, or every few months in the worst-case scenario, Israel is going to have to act 
to, in a certain sense, remind and reinforce to Hamas just who is the stronger party around here. There cannot really be relations of any other kind with an authority that does not accept Israel's uh, right to exist or even existence as a de facto state. Mm -hmm. Just a, a couple of points, but before we go, that there's certain party lines have been thrown out now. You hear it repeated time and time again. One is to refer to the Hamas rockets as firecrackers. If you see these mm. things, they're, they're pretty frightening firecrackers. They kill people. They're not accurate, and Israel takes them out, but they're, they're lethal. So what sort of damage? I asked someone yesterday this. I mean, the damage that one of these so-called firecrackers will do is quite mm. colossal. If they're direct here, it'll kill many people. Absolutely, yeah. Well, we saw that in Ashkelon, of course, when tragically uh, three people were killed in a, a, an attack, a missile attack on an apartment block. There haven't been more Israelis killed, thank goodness, not because of the uh, comical or not serious nature of the ordinance that Hamas is sending over, but rather because of the very sophisticated uh, systems of protection and warning which Israel's citizens uh, enjoy. You know, in other words, the, the, the early warnings, the system of shelters, and of course, very importantly, and one of the most important, I think, lessons of all this, the Iron Dome anti-missile system. That's what's prevented much greater loss of life uh, and loss of property among Israelis, not the uh, nature of the ordinance. This, uh, the Fajr 5 missiles that were landed, that were launched in the direction of Beersheva, Ashkelon, Ashdod, and indeed Tel Aviv. This is very serious Iranian-made ordinance indeed. It's made to kill, and it can kill. And I was fascinated to see, actually, an Al Jazeera report uh, yesterday in which their reporter was caught in the middle of a missile launch on Ashkelon. She looked correctly, absolutely terrified. And I think in many ways, for the viewers of Al Jazeera, that 30 seconds of footage probably taught them more about what's really going on in Israel than the previous uh, week's footage they've got out of their channel. Yeah, if they're willing to learn. And actually, I think the, the other yes, great victory in all this is the, the Iron Dome, because it, it, it says a great deal about Israeli technology and know-how. It's quite extraordinary how effective it is. Look, pleasure always having you on the show, and I'm sure we'll be speaking to you again in the next few days. Thank you, my friend. Thanks, Michael.